Good morning, Stanton. I have, um, well, a startling sounding statistic from the National Institute of Health, the SAMHSA survey that kids, if you're 12 to 17, you recognize these surveys where people are asking to fill in bubbles about how you're doing on a daily or monthly or yearly basis. And it looks as though, again, we have a trend upward in poor mental health among adolescents, 12 to 17. 17% of the U.S. population of adolescents has claimed that they've had a major depressive episode, at least one in the past year. And that's up, let's go back five, six years. That's up um, about 13% of teens in 2017. I have a figure that I'm going to put in post. So people should be looking at a graph now. And that trend goes upward, more so for girls than it does for boys. But generally, among the adolescent cohort, 12 to 17, if you look back to, let's just take 2007, where um, you had 12% of girls, 5% of boys say that they've had a depressive episode in the past, it's all trending upward. And so just a few questions about that. You know, that sounds really scary. And also, I think I want to talk about what that means. Um, depressive episode, by the way, if you don't mind, um, I'm going to list what that could, what could count as a depressive episode. If you look at the um, APA, American Psychiatric Association, it's, it counts if it's a depressive episode, if it's happened for about two weeks and during which uh, an adolescent could exhibit the requisite symptoms of what they call major depressive disorder. So if they have one or more, they count in this statistic. They are low mood, sadness, hopelessness, that things might not improve, um, distractibility, emptiness, psychomotor functioning difficulties, uh, significant weight loss when not dieting, insomnia, a sense of guilt, sense of worthlessness, suicidality. Okay. Question about this that I have. Well, there, it's, there are a few things. One is, are we pathologizing depression, anxiety, mental health disorders in such a way that we've actually built those labels into our lexicon and thus people are declaring that they are depressed more than ever? Versus, is there something fundamentally natural about human beings that they're genetically predisposed to? Well, we know that we don't believe that. Um, and is there something happening in our culture? Is there some some real phenomenon going on where kids really are more hopeless, depressed, feeling like uh, things are not looking up in their future? So I'm going to leave it there. I know you you had an initial thought. You and I have dealt with you're working in a school environment where there are more and more claims that people have clinical syndromes and need counseling. And you and I have written about and done a podcast about, well, we can't change a school into a mental institution. A school already mm -hmm. has a job. So that's at the institutional level. At the cultural level, what you're saying, um, we're going to be doing a podcast about a New Yorker series on therapy, the therapy issue, and they make a big point about what you just said that depression is increasing for uh, everybody, but especially uh, adolescents. And, and you and I recognize that phenomenon and we're going to deal with it. So that's on the one you've talked about. Well, more and more people are presenting with this clinical syndrome. People are doing more and more uptake on it culturally. And you and I have, Here's something that's sort of in between that. You and I have talked about famous people who are among the greatest successes in the universe who are now declaring that they're depressed. You know, people mm -hmm. that it used to be, you sort of had to be dysfunc well, dysfunctional. And now, um, help me out, Zach. Who's the most famous female singer in the world right now? Taylor um, Swift. Taylor Swift has declared that she's depressed. 
Well, and she, she, not only does she fill stadiums and perform, mm -hmm. but she's had to create the superstructure for her own economic how to do it. Yeah. So you're sort of going, if this person has a clinical psychiatric syndrome, uh, uh, forgive my terminology, we all might as well shoot ourselves because she's the most successful human being in the play world. Let me just say, working, okay, so I work at a high school and let me I'll just give a really practical demonstration about how this could go. Um, first of all, by the way, if you, if you look at the reasons people give for feeling hopeless, depressed, or having one of these symptoms, um, it's about half go into two categories. One is their teens are worried about getting good grades, so academic pressure. Um, and about three in 10 kids say they feel pressured to look good and fit in socially. And so I remember when we had these days where people were doing this SAMHSA survey, and I had students who would say, you know, I really am feeling a lot of pressure about this midterm. And I feel like I'm not, you know, doing well lately. I'm in my room a lot. I am depressed. And then they take on this label of I'm depressed, which fulfills them writing in a survey that they're depressed, which then is this like cyclical thing where now us adults and people who are tasked with taking this data and doing something about it are saying, aha, kids are depressed. So at least Let, let's jump to how you deal with that individual kid. Because we're talking about cultural trends. Is it true that kids are more depressed? And you're saying it is true, but what, why is that? What's no, going on? I'm not even saying that. I'm saying what counts as depression? So a normal thing to happen within teenage years is to feel nervous about a midterm exam. And if I have a 15-year-old girl in my class, who has been told that, that that her feeling means she's having one of these major depressive episodes and she understands that that's the case or thinks that that's the case. And then she says, I am depressed, I have depression. She will then fill out on a survey that she is depressed or has depression or has experienced this episode, which then is calculated into the results of she's part of the percentage of people who are depressed. You know what I mean? So that's an official statistic that you and I read and in general, we're going to read those CDC statistics. And if they've gone up, like the graph you're going to show, we're going to say, well, something's happening. And right. we're trying to figure out, well, what's happening? Right. What exactly is happening? So that's at the one cultural level. Now, you yourself are dealing with this girl. And you deal with many young people. So you're deal we're dealing both with the large statistic and with the individuals that compose those statistics. Right. So how did you deal? So you're not worried about NIMH. You don't want her to call NIMH up and revise her answer. You're talking to her as an individual. How right. do you re respond to it? Right. Well, as I was an advisor to kids in this within this cohort and i never once you know i would listen to people talk about how they're doing but i never uh, really acknowledged besides the raw feelings they said that they had or issues that they said that they would like to resolve and talking practically about those issues i've never responded to somebody saying boy you're depressed or do you take medication or anything like that so it kind of the idea of depression or that being something that is building inside of a person or some permanent entity within them, it fizzles out within my conversations or problem solving with kids. And I think for the most part, uh, that's true. I mean, no teacher, even if they buy into this model, no teacher I've worked with at a practical level thinks that they are of the pay grade that they ought to you know, recommend medication or something like that. They deal with people at a totally basic level. And for the most part, like we wrote in our book, Outgrowing Addiction, um, people resolve things that make them feel depressed, especially in teenage years when people are starting to form an identity. So I deal with people just completely practically, and I deal with people as though I'm sure, like I'm betting on 
with the things that ail them are going to resolve because they're going to put their feet forward and resolve them. And I would say both because of the job that you have been given and the fact that people respond to you in your school, that perhaps you're in a somewhat unique environment because kids are getting more and more antidepressants. So you said the teachers you right. know right. are not going to say, oh, my God, you're depressed. Boom. But quite a bit of that is happening in America. And but that is, t- yeah, yeah. And if it doesn't happen where you were at, I can think of three things. Maybe they're only two. You live in a, I'm not going to mention where you live and work. I don't know. When they do these surveys, I get your community is often listed at the top in America of healthiness and happiness. I, it's not the richest community in America by far. So that's A. So maybe you're in a really good environment. B, maybe you're in a really good, sorry, I'm going to have three. Maybe you're in a really good institution, your school district. And one of the things that would make me say that is, well, they hired you to have an overarching relationship with how the school deals with what you and I are just now talking about. Or the third thing I guess I'm just thinking is, um, you just have a positive impact on your immediate environment. So I'm accounting for what's the difference between how you feel and what these statistics, and they're, you know, we're going to talk about a New Yorker magazine article, which, and everybody, New York Times blows these statistics up and everybody believes them. How do you deal with the, so how do you deal, does anybody ever accuse you of being um, Pollyanna? And living in a yep. bubble. Yep. Yeah, but but um, before you make, you're right that statistically speaking, if you look at these surveys, I live in Vermont and teach in Vermont, and that's where um, numbers look pretty good if we're going to be numbers people. But I'm not saying that kids largely are not medicated around here, or that or that they haven't followed the trend of more kids being medicated. I think it's. Last time I checked, it's like something near almost a 50% more medication for depressive disorders in children um, now than in the past five years or something like that. And Vermont is, it's, it follows in that same footprint. So I guess what I'm trying to do is juxtapose, I'm trying to, uh, what I'm, I'm trying to talk out wh- where does this um, d- difference of views happen where kids are able to be diagnosed and then right medicated or treated as though they have some ailment for life and i'm saying i think that in school systems at least from a teacher role model guidance counselor type of perspective um, it's not really happening there i think it's happening as uh as a sort of medical model and um and so i'm trying to tease that apart i mean I, i don't know anyone and i work with people i've and talk to people in school districts across the country um, who, you know, this, unless it's a, a severe episode or something, I don't really know anyone who says, who has a student and says, well, I'm just throwing my hands at this situation. Maybe medication is just the only thing. Um, yet people are coming to school systems heavily medicated or told that they're depressed about things. And I'm trying to figure out what, what that delta is. Well, you know you're I mean? helping me understand some. I, I'm not a teacher, but what you just said, I, I know people like that. I know people mm. who look at children and say, oh, they're depressed. They need antidepressants where I don't, where I have your reaction. So I'm always, one in talking to you, I'm trying to come to grips with that discrepancy you just said. Your experience individually in your institutions, and you're saying even, you know, you deal with teachers and school systems all over, um, you don't find that. So well, I no, what, what I'm really what I'm really saying is that because you wanted to break it down to individuals, you know, who are these individuals? And I'm I'm doing the same thing, but in favor in on behalf of institutions that I work for. Institutionally speaking, schools do know better than any anything else. It's just kind of 
spitting kids as numbers into this funnel where they're diagnosed depressed. However, when I talk to individual educators, they don't seem to be interested in doing that. Somehow, when you get a group of people together who are um, who are tasked with working with a kid or a family through an episode, what turns out is that kids get labeled depressed. But if when I talk to individuals who are supposed to be working with those kids, it doesn't seem like any of, and this is very anecdotal, by the way, but it doesn't seem like any of those individuals per se think that the way to deal with or help the student is to diagnose them and then they'll be better. So somewhere there's a group think that's happening at the level of education that is turning these numbers. But if you break people into their component parts of working with kids, they're not. And I think that's fascinating. And I, I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out where the disconnect happens. Do you have any kind of a neck? That anomaly is something that I always wonder about with regards to you. Mm -hmm. I know, obviously, I know how you think about these things. I know that not only are you employed, you know, you generally have had a job for the last 10 years, but you're a valued employee and people seek you out and try and expand your horizons. Boom. That's one reality. Then there's this other reality that you describe, which you bump into, where uh, school systems in general and people, maybe because they're not talking to you, feel pressurized into putting kids into the depressive category, which has all kinds of consequences. And I'm always sort of wondering, well, is there any way or how can you think about this too? Can you expand your influence? Because on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you see one reality and at the institutional and cultural level, you see another reality. How can you bridge those two? In the day-to-day, -day, let's, let's take something that's not depression or anxiety or something like that. Um, people have really lofty, nice ideas. Actually, we get together at, at my school in a, a meeting that's like a child well-being meeting. And it seems like it's an hour of, what's the word you use? Pollyanna, like, like we can, we'll talk as though it's, it's crazy. We'll talk as though kids are human beings and like, what would you, what would we do if only we could, right? And then we end that meeting and it's like, we're back, back on the grind. Um, none of that even ever existed. We have to just use the standard systems that we have at our disposal and time goes by and time goes by quickly. And um, th then we kind of break into factions of people who, you know, there's the, yeah, we, I and maybe a few others will say the right thing to do is A, B, and C. That's what we do with the, for human beings. That's what our job is. And then there are a majority of people who will say, yeah, but, you know, there's like a hundred kids like that. We can't do that for all of them. We need to somehow expedite this thing. And people don't think about the other shoe dropping. You know, if if the quick thing to do is medicate or funnel somebody into a system or whatever the prop, the issue is with a student, you know, get them on some academic special, you know, resource without actually dealing with them at a human level or try and trying to understand what their issue is, or actually what their strengths may be that we're missing as teachers. Um, that's really detrimental that that can really harm an individual for a long time. So we're doing, what's the term in, um, medicine when the doctors are actually doing the iatrogenic right so we're doing like teachogenic harm to kids I, I think I mentioned before. well we're pointing that out because not only are more kids reporting being depressed suicides are going up so it's not like a joke it's not like somebody made this up right and so you and i and that's the whole drug debt thing we have an approach to among other things addiction and depression and we react to the statistics. People keep saying, well, more and more people are dying. Uh, there's deaths of despair. There's more suicides. And you and I are saying, well, what you're doing isn't working. Yes. Right. And a certain number of people listen to us an individual. We have coaching and counseling and you have a school system position. But somehow at a larger level, well, what, what term group think comes in? Let me give mm -hmm. you another example. 
Liz Evans headed the um, Portland Hotel Services in Vancouver. And she heard me speak um, in England, in Liverpool, and she invited me to come and speak to their group. And what Liz Evans is a practitioner. She's not, you know, doesn't write treatises. What I was saying appealed to her. When I got to her room of coaches, and what they do is they give people housing, they get them involved in jobs, they give them a sense of community. And Liz Evans doesn't deal with people as though they're crazy or tra traumatized. So we had a big group meeting and sort of the first thing somebody says, well, addiction is a brain disease, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going, wait a second. I'm here at the Hotel Portland Services. You don't usually cure brain diseases by giving people a job in a bakery. You know what I mean? That You're working at one level, but it's almost like when they put on their school hat, oh, well, everybody, we have to say it's a brain disease. It's that leap where you can't take your personal understanding and transform it. So what we do, what my books are called something like, the science of experience. How do you translate experience into scientific and the life process program? The life process program says, we're going to take these things about people's individual lives. And we're going to make that the things that make them happier being engaged. And we're going to make that the therapy. Mm -hmm. But that leap, not only doesn't it occur for everybody, but it's almost like when you what you describe, you're talking to somebody and all of a sudden they flip a switch. Oh, now we're talking about a brain disease. I thought we were just talking about the student. But now when we're talking about depression or addiction, forget all that you and I were just discussing. Now we're in, you know, brain disease realm. We had um, just to put it into, you know, like suicide, depression, these are hot topics that people are going to be emotionally invested in. What you said, 1000%, you know, of course, you know that I, I, um, I agree with that. And just to, to not divert, but just to paint an analogy. Again, I work in school systems, and we had a significant amount of people in Vermont uh, retire early or switch to different jobs this year. And I got to go to this conference this summer, where I disagree with 80% of everything they say at the conference, but I, but it's a nice networking opportunity. So that you know? already and, shows uh, <laughs> something's going on if you're disagreeing with 80% right. of what they're saying. Well, and the funny thing is, again, that, that's a, a group think, it, when I'm talking to individuals at this place, and there are hundreds and hundreds, and most of them are with me, you know? So it's funny. Because, so, um, and then I, I'm talking to all these school districts where they have increasing amount of educators who are retiring early or quitting or moving on to something else. And the common thread that I was able to establish without doing some sort of a research study was that um, we have this thing called UDL, Universal Design for Learning. In other words, it's supposed to be something like what we're saying. It's supposed to be um, maybe a child has some sort of a, a deficit in terms of the standard teaching that we're doing. And if they do, then maybe there's some way that some accommodation that they get that makes this learning easier. And if they do get an accommodation, rather than giving them solely an accommodation that makes them feel like they're other, we do this accommodation for the entire class. And generally speaking, when, when that happens, the whole class is using this thing, this tool, whatever it is, maybe a special calendar or visual, um, everyone kind of does better. So we're building on, oh, okay, so this is kind of a new way of teaching the thing rather than this kid's an idiot. Um, but what teachers realize this year is that the common core of the things that we're supposed to teach prescribed by the, the federal government that we ought to teach and ways we ought to teach, they noticed their classes coming in and what they were being asked to teach was not the level of these kids. First of all, the kids did, generally didn't care. That's not what they wanted to learn. And it, it wasn't at the level of any of their students, really. So this concept of universal design went out the window because what do you, if you have a class of 25 and 20 of them could not be less interested, no matter how you spin it in what you're teaching, well, what am I supposed to do? And if you don't have thick enough skin or an ability to be super creative, 
then what you're left with is you're supposed you're teaching the thing you're supposed to teach and while knowing that no one cares in your class. So the teachers need more support themselves. I think so. I think it, I think uh, we should trust our educators that they know how to teach. And so that's the one example of kind of how group think takes hold. They're doing knowingly doing the wrong thing and feeling guilty about it the whole time. And I can imagine this is part of the issue that we're dealing with um, in terms of school systems and kids and parenting. If you put that in a whole ball of wax, when it comes to mental health, well, there probably is something that's right for an individual child, whether it's your student or a peer or, or, or a kid, there probably is something that feels right to do. There's probably a track that's on their pace to go down to make them feel part of things and not so hopeless, but we're told we have to do something else, um, whether that's medicating. And why or, do people or switch way. like that? I want to give one more stupid example. I don't have, I don't deal with students all the time. <clears throat> um, I have a, do uh, a daughter-in-law who has two brothers and they both work in IT and one is a genius. He works for mm. like some <clears throat> big think tank. And so he didn't speak at all until he was six. So I was talking to his brother who has a good job and is very reliable. And I was saying, well, you know, your brother had a lot of trouble and all, but you know, now he's become a genius. And the other brother started expressing resentment that he didn't get the special education his brother got. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, they taught him to take really good notes and to write everything down so he'd be able to tick them off because he wasn't able to verbally express them. So I said, so you felt envious that your brother was in special ed and he picked up skills that you didn't develop with all due respect. And you feel that's why he's like, everybody thinks he's a genius now and you're just a smart guy. So I, I, that's turning the world on its head. You know what I mean? Special mm -hmm. education is just like sort of doing what makes sense. And people who are careful and take, I don't know what special education consists of, and take notes and write things down because you're not going to always remember them. Everybody should know how to do that. Mm. That's what you're sort of saying. What's like, well, special education, the things that work for everybody work for the things that work for kids who need help work for everybody. Yeah. And of course, there are kids who have just a different way of seeing themselves in the world than maybe a majority of people do. And there's, there's an idea that, um, you know, if Timmy has a different way of thinking, well, I'd love to plan a lot of resources his way, but then what about Lizzie and Tina and, you know, Josh, you know, where are we ignoring them? And honestly, What's your answer? I, my answer is uh, maybe I cut this out, but I can't think of any other way to describe it. But my answer is fuck that. You know, it's Josh d ignoring Josh is the sin, you know, ignore or whatever the name I just gave. Ignoring that kid is the sin because um, I've I, I've worked with so many individual students where if once they feel accomplished and part of something, there's a huge positive wave that occurs throughout the group of people they associate with. And uh, I can't tell you, I mean, I can predict that that will happen. I can't tell you exactly how it'll happen. And I think people know that that's true, um, but but they feel as though they're going to, be, it's almost like they teach as though their their father's watching over their shoulder or something like that, you know? It's that uh, we're going to have to call it at the end of the day right here. Yeah. What you and I have, I you know, not... You and I have sort of thick hides. Somehow we've gotten through life where we say X and sort of well, everybody disagrees. And what you just said is, well, fuck you. You know, you <laughs> do it in a very nice way. But that doesn't deter us. And a certain number of people, maybe not that many in my case, admire that they go well you know the guy really believes what he's saying and maybe it makes sense um let me just give one i have a million common sense examples i met somebody who knew the, the uh famous alcohol sociologist harold mulford 
And he said, you know, we really never should have developed the term alcoholism, Mulford said. And so I gave a lecture somewhere and a guy came up to me and he said, you know, everything you say is crazy. It's totally against what I learned. But you're like a Jewish guy from South Philadelphia. And then there was this guy, Harold Mulford, who grew up on a farm in Iowa. And he said exactly the same thing. <laughs> so I started thinking, well, I don't know. Maybe it makes sense. Um, <laughs> Because these two guys, I mean, it's like they were brought up in different planets and they're both saying the same thing. Maybe I should actually think about that thing. Let me recap. We started out by listing an alarming statistic. And as you mentioned, it's not like totally made up. I mean, suicides are happening. Just like when we're talking about the drug field, um, addiction isn't just this some um, phenomenological philosophical game. It's a phenomenological scientific truth. People are dying of drug deaths. People are homeless. And so, likewise, adolescents probably are more depressed. Now, the reason for that and the way that you help ameliorate that are what we're arguing. And and I guess in our terms, we're saying the p person who is taking the, the suicides and depressive episodes most seriously are people who are noticing um, we have a way of dealing with it now. Evidently, that's not working, and perhaps it's making things worse. And so turning to the, what do we do? Well, it sounds, um, I, Aria is, I feel like maybe there's a, an echo here, but there's, we deal with people as individuals and we help them attain what makes sense in their lives and bolster their skills and remain optimistic that they can be a part of a society despite them perhaps being told that they can't achieve that. And you're saying that makes the some outliers, and I think that's true, but I also think that's what people would like to do. And if you can think of a, you know, if somebody out there can think of an alternative that makes more sense, then I'm all for it. it until then, that's how we do things at LPP. And I'm not, I'm not interested. It's gonna fall on deaf ears if you say that that's a stupid way because it's too practical. Well, a good, perfect summary. I would just say my and your mission in life is to translate the practical realities that Liz Evans employees knew that they forgot when they went to the University of Vancouver to get, mm. you know, a master's degree in addiction. We're trying to broadcast common sense that everybody understands. When now Nick uh, Heather says, what Stan Beal has done is to contrast for 40 or 50 years brain theories of addiction with common sense. Mm -hmm. Like what you said, when a kid, a kid can do better, once he starts doing better, everybody who's working with him and everybody who's working with him says, oh, look, he's improving. This is great. Let's do this. So that's our, you know, that's our for want of a better word, that's our cross to bear what the Life Process Program does and what we're trying to do through these podcasts and other things is to bring it, make it go bigger. If there's a person or two out there that hear this going into the school year who's going to be working with students at either parenting or on a teaching or helping basis, then and and this has helped them, I don't know, perhaps reinstill some confidence that their own best thinking is okay then I've done a pretty good job. We do get Thanks letters. Lots.